Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. We are reading the treaties, the, 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 the lengthy discourse that Nichiren captured, titled The Opening of the Eyes, or The Opening of the Eye, or translations as they are. Why did he call it the opening of the eye? Why this treatise, this, this very involved discussion on the opening of the, of the eye? What do you think Nietzsche is actually talking about? Now, obviously, he's, he's citing all kinds of sutras and commentaries and uh, you know folklore, cultural folklore, uh, direct quotes of uh, Shakyamuni's and, and other bodhisattvas like Tendai and Dengyo and Miaolo and Nagarjuna and Vasubha. It's on and on and on. It's a lot of scholarship and quotation going on here. But for what purpose? What I want you to understand is that this treatise this lengthy document is Nietzschean teaching, exploring, understanding, and conveying to his lay followers, his closest senior disciples, anyone who wants to practice Lotus Sutra, Buddhism. This is Gohonzon. That's what this whole discussion about is about. There is the human mind, sentient awareness, the, if you will, the ignorant eye, the eye of samsara, right? We use, the eye analogy is used consistently throughout Buddhism to indicate the facilities of the mind that perceive, cognate, identify, so on and so forth, right? This is what the I, E-Y-E, is about. And in the discourse of the sutras, that analogy is used specifically to indicate the Buddha I as distinctly different. Hmm? So how does that Buddha I manifest? To be in the Buddha I is to perceive, right? Or experience the perceptions and cognitions with utmost clarity, without uh, any kind of coloration, anything in the way. Right? So, what is the transitory phase between the human eye of identification and, right, accruing definitions of everything? Because that's a way of owning things, right? Defining the self. Hmm? But the mission of Buddhism is to detach from that database of identification to experience all of the same things and more in their moment-to-moment -moment instantiation. And th this is where English and many languages struggle with translating the idea of momentum, a life, a freight train of karma, instantiating as it goes through time space moment to moment to moment there's a momentum there think of it this way if you're gonna jump over a puddle right you don't disassemble your body into little chunks and throw it to the other side of the puddle and then put it back together on the other side who is doing that? Hmm? No, you build up energy and you're made of energy 
and you build up a momentum so that the inertia of your momentum will carry you over that puddle, far enough anyway, to land on the other side of the puddle. Now, Buddhism says that just like drawing that out as an animation, if you drew a stick figure, right? You remember those little things you, do, you drew on the corner of a pad of paper? Hmm? And you draw the stick figure in uh, every little position, like every 30 second, uh, 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 partial second, you, just a little bit of movement, like those claymation movements. You just draw the arm a little further. You lift up the leg and the knee a little further and a little further, a little with each successive drawing on every corner of the page. And then you flip through the pages and you see your little, an your little figure animated. Right? So each page is like a moment. And from one moment to the next, this instantiation of the same stick figure changes. Of course, that's a two dimensional animation, right? We call that tweening. You go between this position and this position, we draw all these other positions. And depending on how many positions you draw, your animation is smoother or rougher, so on and so forth. And we don't need to get into a filmmaking course. The point is, as a three-dimensional, four-dimensional being, everything we do works that way. These words that I'm making are taking a concerted effort of neurons and will, emotion, energy to move my jaw, my tongue, my teeth, my throat, pass air, my lungs, everything's working in concert to make vibrati vibrating waves of sound to be heard by your ear, which in, ten in, in its turn vibrates and turns those vibrations into neural right uh, signals to your brain that then goes to the catalog of things that's known and identified and says, this is what he is saying. Right? It's, a, it's a tremendously complex, really mind-blowing activity. Just this talking to one another. Talking and listening. Hmm? We take for granted all of the minutia that's going on in that. But would we ever make the mistake or, make, or have the thought that with every moment of that neuron moving along its neural pathway on its way to a muscle or and creating a tension or a release as a non-existence, as the end of a lifetime and then the beginning of a new one? See, what words we... Oftentimes the words, um, that's why I said transitory, it, it's a phase change. It's like water to ice and back to water and gas. It's all H2O. It's just in a different phase, right? So human life, when we talk about, or Buddhism talks, or no, Buddhism doesn't talk about, eh, it's a language problem, <laughs> obviously. And in language, we see transmigration or other lifetimes. But those are terrible misunderstandings because of language. That what we're discussing in Buddhism is momentum. This energy and momentum constantly instantiating potential, but potential that's nonetheless parametized by its momentum. Right, And it's our will, our consciousness, our how profound our consciousness is, how much we really see and understand that influences how we're manifesting our potential. That's really the crux of our practice. So when Nietzsche talks and he identified... Uh, this gohanzan, as not a thing, but a goal, an aim. What he's talking about in the opening of the eyes, right, is that there's eye closed, 
and there's I open. But in between those two, something's happening, something's changing, something's instantiating. From this moment to this moment, there is a transition, a phase change. Not a whole lifetime, but those moments, they occur, they, they arise they abide and they disappear. They dissolve, right? Now, you can use the words life, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. All of it's life. There's no opposite of life. There's opposite of birth because birth, death, birth, death, birth, death is the process of instantiation with momentum, right? Kinetic energy moving through time space, an experience which can only be had by sentient mind. Right? Makes sense? So, what is Gohanzan? It is that from here to here, there is an occurrence. There is an opening of the eye. The opening of the eye is not the eye open. And the opening of the eye is not the eye closed or a different eye. The opening of the eye is just that. So when we chant to this mandala, we are endeavoring to hold at bay the samsaric identifying eye, the monkey mind, the constant categorization and validation of self, and we are drawing all of our consciousnesses to the single point, myo ho, in the ultimate teachings of Shakyamuni as a method and a tool to draw our attention to, our mental focus away from all the distractions and ideas and desires and cravings. This is why you can't approach or you shouldn't approach your mandala with your desires. That's exactly what we're trying to get free of. So why would you bring your bag of desires like it's some kind of wishing stone? This is the stuff I want, Santa. Give it to me. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Think about it. No, no matter how badly you crave or want something, what you truly want is a clear, unfettered experience of potential such that you can then navigate your samsaric life with total confidence, without doubt, knowing your momentum and the momentum around you. Therefore, everything suddenly aligns. Things aren't just happening at random to you, right? Life is happening around you as you are happening within it. And so there is no discord. There is only influence. Do I choose to continue along this course or do I choose to move this, move this into a different way of expression, way of experience, way of being, right? To, to see that, to understand that, to, to make that an innate experience is to open the eye. Once the eye is opened, then it's no longer Gohonzon, it's Buddha. See, the Gohonzon is that trans that phase shift. Does that make sense? So mandala, tool, 
samsaric tool to focus. Once the focus is attained, namo myoho renge kyo, namo myoho renge, I'm opening the eye, I'm opening the eye, I see it happening. And then you're in Buddha. We may vacillate a lot, right? We call it, uh, some call it fusion with the uh, mandala. Or fusion with Gohonzon. But Gohonzon is not the mandala. Fusion is of the opened eye. The opening of the eye remaining open. So fusion with Gohonzon. Okay. I mean, words are tricky. But just to understand what's happening. Hmm? That's what's important. And so... Again, this lengthy treatise is Nietzschean trying to offer up quotations, scholarship, indications. Look, this is the opening of the eye. This is Gohonzon. Could retitle this treatise, This is Gohonzon. But he doesn't want to make Gohonzon. The object. <laughs> Gohanzen's the objective as a pass through into Buddhaness. Hmm? It's a it's a volition, it's a will to go. Hmm? So he continues. The Six Paramita Sutra says, quote, all the correct teachings expounded by the countless Buddhas of the past and the 84,000 wonderful teachings that I have now expounded may be as, as a whole be divided into five categories. If you look at my entire life's teachings, this is Shakyamuni speaking, within the Six Paramita Sutra, Right? The first sutras, the Buddha's teachings, or the teachings of the attainment of Buddhahood. Hmm? Second, Vinaya, or the monastic rules, behavior rules, behavior rules as an efficacy to train your mind, to train you to know your mind by virtue of strictures on your body. Because at the time, people were not, really conscious of their minds functioning. They just took their what they thought they were conscious of for granted. Their eyes were firmly in samsara, right? Or closed, you might say, in relation to Buddha. Hmm? Third, the Abhidhamma treatises. Now we're getting into the meat of how the mind works, how your behaviors affect your mind and vice versa. Hmm? Fourth, the Prajna Paramita, right? The teachings of the perfection of wisdom. Now that you've got an idea how your mind works and how you communicate with your mind physically, now how do we hone that mind to become more than it is, to develop its potential? The, wisdom, the perfection of wisdom. Hmm? And fifth, the Dharani. Dharani. Wonderful and difficult to understand formulas. Hmm, formulas, interesting word. I wonder what was translated in order to come up with formulas. But what is a formula? It's a way of working what you think is known in order to attain or accomplish or create or manifest influence known things to a different order, to a different manifestation, to a different form. Hmm? Now that we know perfection of wisdom, the mind well, how can we make it conform or use its abilities to achieve something more? Hmm? That's the fifth period. The works in these five collections will instruct sentient beings. In other words, the minds of you and I. 
Among sentient beings, there may be those who cannot accept and abide by the sutras, or the vijnana, or the abhidharma, and the prajna paramita, or there may be sentient beings who commit various evil acts, destructive acts, such as the four major offenses, the eight major offenses, or the five cardinal sins that lead to the hell of incessant suffering, or slander the correct and equal uh, teachings, sutras, or are ichantikas who disbelieve Buddhism itself. That's a bunch of clapper, right? That's just blah, blah, blah. In order to wipe out such offenses, give quick release to the offenders and allow them to enter into nirvana at once, I preach for their sake this collection of dharanis. This is the six paramitas sutra, right? These five divisions of the dharma are compared to the fly, five flavors of milk, cream, curdled milk, butter, and ghee. We've heard that from time immemorial, yeah, respectively, with ghee as the finest, the clarified butter. The division containing the dharanis compares to the ghee. Ghee has the finest and most subtle flavor among the five substances enumerated above and is capable of curing various sicknesses and easing the minds and bodies of sentient beings. And they gave a lot of uh, powers to this process of clarified butter. Yeah? Similarly, the Dharani division stands foremost among the five divisions of the teachings because it can do away with grave offenses. And once you learn how to work with the mind to achieve more than simply existing, then you can actually change the direction of your life, including your health, right? And outdo or undo previous wrongs. The Profound Secret Sutra states, now we're jumping to a different sutra, quote, at that time, the Bodhisattva superlative truth appearing addressed, uh, addressed the Buddha, saying, World honored one, in the first period of your teachings, when you were in the forest sage ascetic gathering or deer park in Varanasi, for the sake of those who wished merely to seek the vehicle of the voice hearers, the learners, the shravakas, you expounded the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths, in this way turning the wheel of the correct law. This was a very wonderful thing, a very rare thing. No heavenly or human being is of any countless, uh, in any of the countless worlds has ever been able to expound such a doctrine as this before. And yet the wheel of the law that you turned at that time left room for improvement, left room for doubt. It was not yet final in meaning and offered ample opportunity for dispute. Then world-honored one, in the second period of your teaching, for the sake of those who wished merely to seek the great vehicle, you taught that all phenomena are without distinctive natures of their own, that there is no birth or death, that all things are basically in a state of quietude, and that the nature of beings is they exist continuously uh, as they exist, constitutes nirvana itself. You turned the wheel of the correct law, although you did not reveal the whole truth. This was even more wonderful and even rarer thing, but the wheel of the law that you turned at that time left room for improvement, left room for doubt. It was not yet final in meaning and offered ample opportunity for dispute. Do you understand why Nietzsche is quoting these previous sutras? within the context of exploring what Gohonzon is. Hmm? He's indicating, Shakyamuni's been talking about this all along, but through gradual steps, opening the minds of the individuals who were practicing, who had difficulty understanding the potential they had and where that potential was located. 
Now, world honored one, in the third period of your teaching, for the sake of those who wish to pr practice the vehicle that saves all beings, you taught that all phenomena are without distinctive natures, that there is no birth or death, and that all things basically are in a state of quietude, and the nature of beings exists, constitute nirvana, and then you taught that the nature you spoke of itself lacks anything and can be called a nature. You have then turned the wheel of the correct law and expounded these doctrines in their perfect form. This is most wonderful, the rarest thing of all. This wheel of the law that you've turned leaves no room for improvement, no room for doubt. It is truly complete and final in meaning and offers no opportunity for dispute. But does it? The Great Wisdom Sutra is quoted as saying, when one regards whatever teaching one hears, either secular or Buddhist, as an expedient means, one is brought to understand that these can be incorporated into the profound principles that prajna, wisdom, or Buddha wisdom, alone can grasp. Without this wisdom, it's confusing. You just don't understand. You have to build your understanding, your profundity of understanding, in order to now, ah, aha, yeah, get it. When, with the same wisdom, one understands that all secular matters and actions represent the essential nature of things, one will see not a thing that is outside that essential nature. This is where this equanimity comes from, right? Once as I was saying earlier, you're, you transcend through Gohanzan, you, you migrate, you change the phase of your mind from identification, collection, and identity to experience what's actually going on with everything, then whatever database you have for everything is just a bunch of words on top of a process that's Identical in everything. Energy forming with certain tendencies and conditions. Wow, isn't that amazing? It's like trying to define every molecule of water in a stream. You can say, well, that one's being a bubble and that one's rubbing on a rock and that one's going over moss and that one's going through a fish's gills and that one's... It's all water. Hmm. Things get very... Calm, quietude. Hmm? The first volume of the Maharvanarchana Sutra states, quote, Master of Secrets, Vajrasattva, there is a great vehicle practice that arouses the mind that is without attachment to things and leads one to understand that all phenomena are without individual natures. See, it's those individual natures that our samsaric mind is obsessed about identifying. But it's smoke. It's not essential. It's not, in a way, real. It's just colors. Why is this? Because in the past times, those who practiced this way were able to observe the alaya consciousnesses within the five components and to realize that individual natures are illusory. The alaya consciousness, just to remind you, is the repository of your, that's your karmic freight train. So to understand the alaya consciousness is to understand the freight train of energies manifesting that participate, exist, and color everything they encounter. Do you see? That's why we have the opinions we have. That's why we have a favorite color. That's why we are different skin tones, different, different hair, different sexes. Different, all those differences are in the Alaya collection of energies manifesting. Hmm? But you've changed your opinion over time. You've had to. So it's not indelible. 
it's influenced by moment to moment changes, perceptions, aha. Hmm? It's happening anyway. But when we practice Buddhism, we do it on an immense scale rather than that little individual, right? The same sutra also says, quote, Master of secrets, these men in this way cast aside the concept of non-self and came to realize that the mind exists in a realm of complete freedom and that the individual mind has from the beginning never known birth or death. Now, don't get confused. It's not the, about the mind's birth or death. It's about the mind's identification of things as permanentized and dying or disappearing. It's just the process. It's just the water molecules in the stream. It's not that the molecule suddenly appeared and then died, right? It's momentum. The consciousnesses, this, the, the, the amala and all of the consciousnesses appear in a state of sentience, and that's brief. But the entire purpose, if there's a purpose, the entire opportunity of that sentience is to be aware of this magnificent process. Be content until you expire. Your contentment, I don't mean to make that sound bland, should be exciting because you can influence the universe. You can influence this whole thing from your little tiny spot and temporal time of momentum, awareness, influence. That's, that's the essence of life. To become completely aware and to then share that awareness so that all those who participate in this moment after moment of life can make of it beauty, serenity, love, rather than destruction, competition, right? I, we're only here briefly. Let's make this wonderful. Why not? Or you can just choose to go through life as, what the hell is this? Oh, God. I don't want to be here. Well, you won't be for long. What a great way to have spent your time in life. Hmm? It sounds silly when you think of it that way, doesn't it? It also says, quote, emptiness is by nature removed from the sense organs as their objects or their objectives. There's that problem again, noun, verb, right? Emptiness, by its nature, removed from the sense organs and their objects. It has no form or boundaries. Beyond any futile theory, it is equal to space. It represents the ultimate in the absence of individual nature. Do you understand what that's saying? Take a moment. It's not saying emptiness in a physical way. It's saying that if you try to grasp your mind right now, wherever you're going to try to grasp it, <laughs> there is nothing to grasp. It is the moment of itself. It is consciousness emergent from this apparatus to become aware of this very process we call life. Life is also not something you can grab. 
right? The truth, the reality of this process of life is not pocketable. You can't put it in a warehouse. You can call it names, but they don't. So what? It's a constantly ongoing process happening. It never leaves behind and it never sets ahead. It is happening right now, moment to moment. Therefore, the physical idea that it has permanence is empty. That's what emptiness is in Buddhism. The realization that the things we cling to are not the process of life. They're collections of a weird, perverse kind of identification with, but they're just, they're detritus. They're previous moments. They're just the footprints. They're not, they're not the foot, but they're more to the point. They're not the travel. Hmm? Travel is empty. It also says, quote, The Buddha Mahavarachana addressed the Master of Secrets, saying, Master of Secrets, what is the meaning of enlightenment? It means to understand one's own mind as it truly is. Not as a collection of data, but as it is ising, being. What could Nietzsche possibly be talking about here? He's referring to all of these old sutras, all of these old teachings. He didn't start out saying these things. He's prepared the ground and he's saying, look, over and over again. This is why I, Nietzsche, have identified it, given a, a word. Not because I invented it, but because this has been the teaching all along. And in the lifespan chapter of the Lotus Sutra, he really nails it to the ground. And then he explores it again for us in the Treasure Tower teaching, the chapter, right? All of these things. Constantly referring to this opening of the eye. This aha, this renge, yes? The Flower Garland Sutra states, quote, Among the various beings of all the different worlds, there are few who seek to practice the vehicle of the voice hearers. There are still fewer who seek that of the cause-awakened ones, the realization, yeah, prachaka buddhas. Yeah? And those who seek the great vehicle are extremely rare. Right? The Bodhisattva vehicle, the vehicle of the Buddha way. It's unheard of early on. To seek the great vehicle is relatively easy to do. To seek it, right? To look for it. But to have confidence in the doctrines of this sutra is difficult in the extreme. And how much more difficult is it to uphold this sutra? Keep its teaching correctly in mind, practice them as directed, and understand their true meaning. To take the major world system and hold it on the top of your head without moving for the space of a kalpa is not such a difficult thing to do. Put the Milky Way on top of your head. Sure, no problem. <laughs> But to have confidence in the doctrines of this sutra is difficult in the extreme. Holy crap. <laughs> Why even bother, right? <laughs> to offer utensils for comfort for the space of a kalpa to all the living beings who are as countless as the dust particles of the major world systems will not gain one much merit. But to have confidence in the doctrines of this sutra will gain one merit in great quantity. 
to hold ten Buddha lands in the palm of one's hand and remain stationary in the midst of the air for the space of a kalpa is not so difficult to do. But to have confidence in the doctrines of this sutra is difficult in the extreme. I think we're getting it, yeah? To offer utensils for comfort for the space of a kalpa to all living beings who are as countless as dust particles of those ten Buddha lands will not gain one much, much merit. But to have confidence in the doctrines of this sutra will gain one merit in great quantity. For the space of a kalpa, one may honor and give alms to the various thus come ones who are as countless as the dust particles of those ten Buddha lands. But if one can accept and abide by the doctrines of this chapter, one will gain vastly greater merit. And what am I always talking about, about this channel, about what we're studying for? Why study? Why practice daily? Why get a proper mandala? Why? Why do any of this? Right? We're conditioning ourselves. Hmm? And we require confidence to do it. Without confidence, what we do ceases to have import, has meaning, have the desired effect. It's ironic, isn't it? Chanting opens Gohansan to Buddha experience immediately. But it doesn't, it's not necessarily so. Because if our mind is full of doubt, if our mind is on a mistake we're trying to fix in our samsaric life, or something we crave, and we're just going through the motions, we can be chanting as loud as you want, looking directly at our mandala. Namo myoho renge kyo, man, maybe I shouldn't paint it gray. I mean, our monkey mind is, is very clever, very powerful, omnipresent. But, I mean, if that's what it takes for you to shut that down, is simply to focus harder. Myoho, namo myoho renge kyo. Buddha, 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 now you will expel those other thoughts. They will become meaningless. How long does it take? It depends on your will, your volition, your desire to enlightenment above all else. So that's individual, isn't it? Moment to moment in your life. But the one thing that will help immeasurably in your accomplishing that is something Nietzsche is constantly reminding of us. And he's talking about it all over the place here. Confidence. We are samsaric beings. So we need that confidence. We need to know we can do this. And that's how we do it. It's a little bit of the cart before the horse, but it works every time. The Nirvana Sutra says, quote, Although the various correct and equal sutras of the great vehicle will bring in inestimable merit, there is no way to describe how much merit, how much greater is the merit gained through this sutra. It is a hundred times, a thousand times, a billion times greater, greater in every way that is beyond calculation or simile. Good man, milk comes from the cow, cream is made from milk, curdled milk is made from cream, butter is made from curdled milk, and ghee is made from butter. Ghee is the finest of all. One who eats it will be cured of all illnesses, just as if all kinds of medical, uh, medicinal properties were contained in it. Good man, the Buddha is like this. The Buddha experience, yes? The Buddha brought forth the twelve divisions of discourse. 
There's a link on threefoldrows.com called The Twelve Divisions. You can go figure that out and uh, download it for yourself and read through it to understand that. It's not important at this point. Just know that this is what he's referencing. From among these twelve divisions, he brought forth the sutras. From among the sutras, he brought forth the correct and equal sutras. From the correct and equal sutras, he brought forth the doctrine of the Prajna Paramita, the perfection of wisdom. And from the perfection of wisdom, he brought forth the Nirvana Sutra, and the Lotus, obviously. The Nirvana Sutra is comparable to Gi. Gi here is a metaphor for the Buddha nature, the experience of Buddhaness, yeah? It is the finest experience, perceptive involvement, being with, living, being. Maximal potential. What, words, words, words. Hmm? All of this in service to the idea of this portal from samsaric reality to, oh, it's been here all along. Just didn't look at it that way. Didn't see it that way. Didn't have the right lens, whatever. Was looking through my eyelids. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Kwan san. Namo myo renge kyo. Thank you for listening, participating, studying, practicing. You guys are incredible. This takes effort. It doesn't happen by itself. It takes a conscious mind, a sentient mind, and a will with confidence to establish buddhaness. Hmm? So please have confidence. Stay strong in your practice. Take care of your health. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Helps propagate. It's Bodhisattva work, right? Don't forget, if it's helpful, please download the uh, e-books. Get the print books if you prefer. The, the, uh, the, the podcasts, it's all free. The podcasts are, right? And all that free info on threefoldlows.com. That's why it's there, to help raise your confidence. Not only for your own practice, but in how to communicate it to others. Start with Daimoku, and then have at it. Thank you. I'll see you in the next one, okay? Bye for now. <laughs>